this is by way of an introduction so it's going to be slightly theory light because I didn't want to go into the detailed theoretical arguments at, at this stage because others will actually be doing this later in the session but what I hope to do is sorry by way of an introduction show some of the pr practical problems um, when basically we're out there dealing with the evidence excavating or sort of going through archives in trying to identify either hierarchies or heterarchies from the archaeological evidence you know especially where the nature of that evidence might be considered you know ambiguous to say the least and so in order to do that that's where we are um, I will be considering the evidence from the Iron Age and Romano British periods in the Midlands and Northern England, particularly the modern counties of Nottinghamshire and South and West Yorkshire, which is, of course, the county which Bradford is self situated within. Now, I, I don't want to get too hung up about talking about the landscapes, but you know, there's a wide range of topography and landscape character zones within this. And again, this might have been a contributory factor to the equally great diversity that I think we can see in the prehistoric and Roman archaeology, the later prehistoric archaeology. And also, one other thing is that, um, I know I've banged on about this before, but the character of this archaeology is strikingly different to many adjacent areas of northern, central and eastern England. So, in terms of preceding Bronze Age settlement archaeology, there's comparatively little known from this region. Um, two interesting sites that have come up through developer-funded fieldwork were at Swillington Common near Leeds and South Emsall, which was on the border between South and West Yorkshire. And at both, you've got middle to later Bronze Age and late Bronze Age to early Iron Age open settlements of post-built roundhouses and they're associated with a, a few four-post granary structures and then also at Swellington Common you've got this unusual um, palisaded enclosure there at the top this almost sort of D-shaped structure and then at South Emsall you've got the roundhouses were situated within a, a, a sort of sub-rectangular palisaded enclosure which was formed by a post trench now there were very few finds from these palisaded structures and whatever their precise fo social function they're you know, certainly rather different to the sort of possible Bronze Age elite centres that people have supposedly identified developing in eastern and southern England. So another regionally unusual site is Sutton Common in South Yorkshire where following the deliberate destruction of the earthworks by a, a farmer um, rather inadequate unfortunately rescue stripping and recording um, sort of revealed over 150 four post granaries though of course it's not known if those are all contemporary and the enclosure itself featured massive banks and ditches timber palisades and, and huge timber gateways but there was no evidence for sustained domestic occupation however you might want to define that very few artifacts and even if it was the smaller enclosure which still survives even if it was that which was where the actual inhabitation was the whole site sat in basically a, a sort of raised peat mire and it's very difficult to see you know where the arable sort of production and contemporary settlement nearby would have been it's sort of very isolated and on its own so yes this could have been the residence of a chiefly elite but equally it could have been a communal focus for storage and ritual and so to hill forts, which, you know, quite often in those traditional, particularly Iron Age models, sit at the top of these hierarchies. And um, uh, Tessa Poller um, from Glasgow University, she's memorably termed, she's talked about the, the weight of hierarchies that hang from hill forts. And I love that expression. So that's, you know, not only when considering their construction and use in the past, but, you know, the fact that they're still fetishized and placed as a supposedly unified category of monuments at the sort of spatial and social pinnacle of other forms of occupation. But, you know, as John Collis, J.D. Hill and many others showed in the 80s and 90s, 
they were far from a unified group of constructions and across Britain may have performed a wide variety of roles. And particularly in this region, it's really striking. There's only a few classic hill forts known. There's just a couple from West Yorkshire and one from South Yorkshire at um, Winkerbank in Sheffield. So the excavation evidence and dating for them all is all extremely poor, which doesn't help. But it seems very unlikely that A, they were very intensively occupied, and B, that they were occupied basically after the Middle Iron Age. That sounds, seems, at the moment, very, very unlikely indeed. Um, there's a few um, Iron Age and Roman coin hoards found within a few kilometres of Castle Hill Armenbury up there. And they might indicate that this was a sort of locale of sort of social or political significance. But equally, the fine spots might have been chosen because of these prominent landscape settings or mythical associations. So we shouldn't automatically make a sort of equation between coin hoards and hierarchies there either. And if we move to another sort of category of evidence, linear earthworks, in southern England, Cunliffe argued that the construction of these during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age reflected a, a widespread sort of reordering of the landscape, in some cases possibly imposed by emerging social elites. And in East Yorkshire, where extensive systems of such banks and ditches were constructed, the evidence instead suggests a piecemeal and more heterogeneous process with many earthworks a response to local topographic and social processes and Chris, Mel and Emily here at Bradford have, have all covered this in their research and you know some might have resulted from hierarchical coercion and impositions but others could equally well have been cooperative communal um, endeavours and similarly, within my study region, the Roman Rig in South Yorkshire and the Aberford Dykes in West Yorkshire, they don't appear to have been the result of single planning and construction episodes. And rather, I see them as having emergence and contingent properties. Clearly, they were sort of constructed in different stages and there didn't seem to be an overall plan behind it. And so we come to nice shiny things, which is supposedly another category of prestige or high status, sort of proxy indicators of, of elites. And alas, uh, you know, in, in the Midlands, Eastern England and East Yorkshire, there's certainly fine metalware objects, torques, brooches, swords, that kind of thing, horse and carriage gear. Alas, though, in this area, that's pretty much it, actually. Apart from brooches, that's all you get in this part of the world. Just those few. And to some extent, this situation persisted into the Romano-British period as well, with comparatively few items of fine Roman metalwork outside a few villa and urban settlements. And also in this region, apart from iron smithing, there's very little evidence for Iron Age metalworking. And though Nottinghamshire, for example, did have its own Iron Age coinage, very little of that actually made its way sort of further north than that sort of Trent, Don sort of watershed line. So again, there's very little Iron Age coinage in this part of the world. And although in East Yorkshire, for example, fine metalwork was deposited in the graves of possible notable persons who had either been born into social elites or perhaps more likely accrued significance and status during their lifetimes, including some female individuals, as Mel has quite rightly drawn attention to. In the study region, you've got a dearth of Iron Age burials. You've just got a few crouched inhumations. Um, most don't have any artifacts with them. Occasionally you get an iron brooch, maybe a leg of a pig, something like that. Um, the one exception is the Ferry Fryston individual who was buried in a, in a small square barrow. And there's obviously some um, correlates between this burial rite and what was going on in East Yorkshire, but there's also many differences. And interestingly, it looks like this individual, if you believe the isotope evidence, is actually from outside the sort of West Yorkshire region as well. He, he was born and raised somewhere else, which might again be very significant. Um, Chris Cumberpatch and others have uh, <coughs> researched ceramic production and consumption 
and sort of shown quite conclusively that, well, it was pretty grotty, basically. Most Iron Age pottery was handmade. Um, it's probably being produced on a household level, um, and it's relatively plain and undecorated. And what also seems to be the case is few households would have had pots at any one time, and they might have used mostly wood or leather vessels instead. And interestingly, quite a lot of the pottery and potentially the clays was actually coming from outside the region, from the north, from Humberside, um, the east and south from the Midlands and Northamptonshire and Lincolnshire. So even in the Iron Age, there doesn't seem to be of any sort of centralised production. And even uptake of Roman vessels was comparatively s slow. And in parts of West Yorkshire and South Yorkshire, they don't even really take to Roman greyware until the sort of mid-2nd century AD. They see this stuff and think, nah, it's not for me. So, Sue Oosthausen has argued that rather than hierarchies, we can look at patterns of fields and field systems in prehistoric Britain and see that they're indicative of common property regimes, what she calls CPRs, CPRRs. Um, but as Helen Wickstead and Bob Johnston and many others have pointed out, uh, you know, getting at tenurial rights and land ownership in the past from evidence from things like field systems is incredibly difficult. And despite some claims to the contrary, there is absolutely no evidence for private land ownership in Iron Age Britain, and I'd argue right across Europe for that matter. Um, and so you've got extensive field systems that have been identified across the region, which did originate in the late Iron Age. They seem to have expanded in the Roman period. But, you know, although there's a lot of diversity there, some appear to be quite nucleated and irregular and develop more organically. Now, others ostensibly do seem quite planned and regular and from some form of sort of planned endeavour. Alison Deegan's used GIS analyses to sort of break these down into sort of groups according to size and area. And these might be the holdings of particular households or, or farmsteads or lineages. But alternatively, you know, there might have been functional land use concerns behind this. And it's, oops, it's certainly the case that where extensive areas have been excavated, as at Armthorpe in South Yorkshire, this apparent uniformity that you see on the crop marks, it just breaks down completely. And it was shown that basically fields were being added to one another over time. And even the double ditch trackways did not start off as double ditch trackways. They were field boundaries. So these are emergent sort of structures. I, w I would see them as, as very much meshworks or assemblages that kind of develop over time in, in, in many sort of complex heterarchical ways. And there might have been some kind of longer term overall planning, but it's very hard to see this as the idea of some kind of top down hierarchical imposition. And nor are there any clear relationships between settlement size and field patterns either. And when you look at things like enclosures, there's incredible diversity in settlement size and shape, and people have tried to come up with uh, typologies, as you might imagine, and I tried to do it for my PhD thesis and then realised it would be better to go out and get drunk instead, because there's absolutely no point. There's just too much diversity. And, you know, you've got D-shaped ones, banjo forms, clothesline enclosures, agglomerated versions, and yeah, there's some diachronic trends. You've got sort of gradually over time, more irregular ones become sub-rectangular. But even so, that's just a very, very broad trend. There's always exceptions. And it doesn't really reflect clear chronological or status differences. <coughs> On the edges of some floodplains and also in some elevated areas, you've got um, some uh, enclosures associated with double ditch trackways and I've argued elsewhere that these are specifically to do with the movement of large numbers of animals on a seasonal basis and some of these things even have areas where potentially animals could be assembled and displayed and perhaps we have got to think about status and potentially hierarchy being based on numbers and quality of livestock and if so then that was probably very fluid and not fixed 
And using ethno-historic evidence, Jeremy Taylor has noted that, you know, over many different communities in many different parts of the world, for farmers, what matters most is farming, not conspicuous consumption or portable riches. And wealth is measured in things like land holdings, crop yields, and livestock. And, you know, this is more, ev this is more evidence of heterarchies rather than rigid hierarchies. And you have got some sort of groups in the Trent Valley where you seem to get these groups of agglomerated enclosures. It's a horrible term, I know. Um, but even here, only a few have been excavated. So some of these seem to be areas where um, you've got sort of, uh, from in some cases, early Iron Age pit alignments, and you've got the development of these enclosure groups. One or two of them turn into villa complexes as well. So very long chronologies to some of them. And some of these do feature finer pottery and metalwork, particularly by the sort of later Roman period. But again, there's a lot of diversity. And with the ones that are just crop marks, we're not sure if these enclosures were added to one another over time, if these are really big settlements where all the enclosures were occupied at the same time, or if things are being added progressively and occupations shifting around. So are these you know, particularly high status households or lineages, or is it actually multi-household communities? And similarly on magnesian limestone areas, you've again got some of these agglomerated enclosure sites, particularly in, in West Yorkshire between um, Leeds and uh, Castleford and Weatherby. And again, a lot of these are associated with trackways and corrals, so perhaps livestock are important to the de development of these. And again, a few of them in the late Roman period do seem to get quite wealthy. Some develop into villas. This one had a very nice um, villa, um, Isled Hall, and this hypercorsted bathhouse and usual Roman things, dead dogs and all the kind of things you'd expect from a sort of higher status Roman settlement. But there's not very many of these. And as with villas anywhere in Britain, really, trying to identify any clear hierarchy of land holdings associated with the core of these settlements is extremely difficult. And, you know, even in southern England, it's proved virtually impossible to identify villa estates. <clears throat> this is one I was involved with the excavation of it at Wattle site near Weatherby. And again, you've got this very unusual trilobal uh, um, shape. Maybe the central area was used as a sort of livestock corral or paddock. Um, again, this is occupation from the late Iron Age right through to the Roman period. Relatively large quantities of ceramics and metalwork. But again, is this a successful local lineage? A clan of several families? The residence of a single wealthy individual household? I, I certainly wouldn't go for the latter. I would tend towards one of the former explanations. So, in summary, the region had very few obvious central places, if we still believe in those as archaeologists, during the early to middle Iron Age, and even in later periods. And it's uncertain what those later agglomerated enclosure groups actually represented. There is little evidence for special metalwork and pottery production, that seems to be very much a, a household craft level, and relatively little high status metal work at all. And apart from the Ferry Fryston burial, there's no direct evidence for high status individuals. And there was great diversity in enclosure size and form, field layout and size. And even in the Roman period, clearly the Romans were a hierarchical society. They built forts and some towns like Doncaster and Castleford. And obviously you had a few villas develop, but not many in this region. But even then, most rural settlements actually remain very small scale and very diverse. And only some of those agglomerated settlements. So I would argue that you know, if, when you look at the ethno-historic and ethnographic evidence for peasant communities, for example, yes, they're within a hierarchical society, but if you break that hierarchy down, there's a series of much more diverse heterarchical relationships within that. It's much more, it's a much flatter sort of type of society, or probably types of society, than a simple sort of hierarchical pyramid. 
And obviously, you know, people have talked about conviviality and mutualism and cooperation in small scale societies. Of course, you've also got the flip side of that. You've got the personal conflicts and the feuds that can split communities. I lent you my saw three months ago. You still haven't returned it. I'm taking one of your pigs. I'm not talking to you ever again. That kind of thing. And we know that this can split villages and cause animosity that lasts generations. And I'm also acutely aware that I've not had time to look at hierarchical and or heterarchical relations of particularly things like age and power within these communities, which I think is something to also bear in mind, actually within these households, within these communities. So, you know, I would see within the region, is this a product of hierarchical social structures from small family groups to, you know, wealthy individuals and chiefs? Or are these much more diverse heterarchical communities with much more fluid and dynamic social relations even in the Roman period? So what I hope I've demonstrated is that such theoretical questions are sometimes far from easy to answer based on the archaeological evidence, although that shouldn't stop us discussing them here today. Thank you very much.